her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. What an image. As we see uh, brides that are dressed for their wedding day in, in nice extravagant gowns, they're, they're white and they're beautiful. But here what we see, the fine linen, are the righteous acts. What you do for the king, what you do for your Lord, is how you're going to be clothed. Now that tells me there are going to be some people that walk to their Lord Jesus Christ on that day, beautiful, arrayed in, in such garment, as we can symbolically say. And symbolically we can also say the opposite. Some are going to be running to Jesus naked. <laughs> because there aren't too many righteous acts for some folks. <laughs> the passage in verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride. Who's His bride? Church. We are. The church. The local church. The universal church. We are. The individual church. We are the bride. We are the bride. And the bride here in Revelation 19 has made herself ready. Ready for the King. Ready for the King. We've not made ourselves ready for ourselves, but we've made ourselves ready for the king. How can we do that? What we see there in verse 7 is that we were built for intimacy. You and I were built for intimacy. We were built, and I'm, we, we can go off on this marriage relationship kind of intimacy all day long with this thought, but we're going to avoid that today. We're going to be talking primarily with we were built for intimacy with God. Intimacy with Him. A personal relationship. Something that Muslims cannot have. Something that other religions cannot have because their God is not personal to them. Their God spun the world into existence and stepped back and said, good luck. But with Jesus Christ, He is the epitome of personal God. Now, God was still personal before Jesus Christ came in the New Testament. We see that in the Old Testament, God is personal. And he wants us to have a personal relationship with him, an intimate, intimate relationship with him. Not some manufactured machine, not some manufactured ritualistic religion. He wants an intimate relationship. That means to us. Because some of us are probably scared with that word intimate, because some of us may not even be intimate with people in this room, or even with our spouse. Intimate means that you are completely transparent, that you speak openly to this person, that you have all in your heart and all to give to this individual, this other person. You are completely open. The most intimate relationship that we see in Scripture is Adam and Eve. Do you notice that before this day came, they didn't have a stitch of clothes on and they were not ashamed. Why was it that they put clothes on? Because the ashamed hit them. Why was it that they were ashamed? They were naked from the beginning. They're still naked. They're ashamed because they had something to hide from God. So they clothed themselves. It's a symbolic sign of saying, I'm ashamed. And that clothing to God, and hear this thought out, please. That clothing to God was a shield of intimacy. Don't take your clothes off right now, please. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> we are built for intimacy. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. once said, everybody basically has an empty hole inside of them that they try to fill with money, drugs, alcohol, power, and none of the material <coughs> stuff works. We live in a world of heightened social media. We live in a world where everybody has a Facebook account, a Twitter account, some Google Plus account. We all have a social media. We live in a world where connectivity is at its highest. Communication is at its highest. Intimacy is rock bottom. We can all be in one room, and we can all be sitting there on our phones, right here, right here. I can be sitting right next to somebody, but I'm right here. I'm laughing, and I'm going. Somebody's right here, and I'm going, and I'm going. And they're sitting next to me, and they're doing this too. There's no intimacy. We're all diving into technology. Not that this itself is bad. It's how we're utilizing it. Because sometimes when we're sitting right here and somebody right here is doing it, sometimes what we need is to put that down and build this relationship. Look into somebody's face, talk into their ear, listen to what they've got to say, pray for them, give them a handshake, don't give them a hug, but give them a handshake. You know, holy kids, whatever you do, you can do that, all right? Hugs are creepy, but you can do that. I don't hug, all right? I, I, I punch, but you know, whatever for you. Social media has heightened communication where we think we've got all these friends and all these relationships. We're redefining the word friend. What is truly a friend? Is it someone that you just have a pen pal with? Because that's really what social media has made us become. I don't have to see them anymore because now I'm a pen pal. It's not intimate. 
ourselves. The church's job today, starting in 2001, 2007, when big social media jumped out, the job of the church today is not just to be an email base, not just to be a letter sender, but to be a face that is seen, a voice that is heard, a hand that is shook, feet that walk with you. We are to be the physical manifestations of Jesus Christ. So that means we can't be lazy. It means we've got to get out there. We are all built for intimacy. At the bottom of all this spiritual sickness that, that I'm talking about, our lack of intimacy with each other comes from our lack of intimacy with God. The recovery of intimacy starts with allowing God to become intimate with us. And I dare say some of us in this room don't even know how that begins. We're getting to that point. Genesis 1, 26, 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, and according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, um, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over creeping things that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of he. He created them, male and female. He created them. I created you like me, God is saying. I want a relationship with you, God is screaming through every page of Scripture. We were created to know Him and fellowship with Him. Intimacy is fellowshipping with Him every moment that you've got a chance. If you're married to someone that's quality time in their love language, like I am, my love language is words of affirmation. Send me a card, I'm good. An email, text, that's nice. It makes me feel great. My wife, on the other hand, is a quality time person. You know quality time people, they need to be around you in a quality situation. No TV, nothing going on, just face to face, eye to eye. Quality. It takes time to do that. It takes intentionality to do that. God is a quality time kind of God. He always has been. He wants your time. He wants you in a relationship with Him. As Augustine once said, there's a God-shaped hole in every human being, and we will never be happy until we find peace with Him. God equipped us, made us that way. In Deuteronomy 16, 16, we see where they were commanded to meet with the Lord three times annually. And you're like, woohoo, I covered that. I meet with God more than three times a year. This isn't the kind of meeting we're talking about here kind of meeting that we see here are the priests that are going through hours and hours of ritualistic cleaning before they went into where the Lord was to meet with him. Now, they had to go throughout the rest of the year praying and, 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 and speaking to God and, 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 and memorizing scriptures and, and, and helping each other and serving one another. They had to do all these things that you and I are like, whoa, that, that should be intimate. That wasn't the intimacy that he was talking about in the Old Testament. We see in Psalm 42, 7, he says, the deep calls to the deep. We all yearn for this deep relationship. And I believe God himself, being this deep, intimate God, is reaching out and calling to you deeply. But it's so deep and it's so callous, so many levels up, that we cannot identify that pain that is so deep down. And the pain is there because there's, a, there's an echo in that heart, in that deep, because he's calling out. Psalm 54, 4. God is seen as a friend. Isaiah 42, 44, 2. We see that God has favorites. God favorites. He favors people. Hebrews 6, 19. We are called to reach and allow God to reach the most holy place. We see many times in Scripture, intimacy is found throughout Scripture. In today's culture, and technological culture, we miss it. We substitute intimacy with convenience. What's better, ramen noodles from the microwave or a nice crock pot full of food that's been stewing all day? And if you say ramen noodles from a microwave, you already show us how sick you are. <laughs> it's good, I can tell you, it's good, I like it, but... It ain't nothing like a stew that's been stewing in a crock pot for a long time. God desires intimacy with us. Boris Beckray, tennis star, once said, 
He said this, I have won Wimbledon, uh, Wimbledon twice before. Once as the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything, and yet they are so unhappy. I had no inner peace. I was a puppet on a string. Revelation 19.7, let me remind you what it says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. What's at stake? What's at stake with this intimacy thing? He is coming. The Lord is coming. I don't know when He's coming, but He's coming. He could come today. He could come tomorrow. He could come in 10 years. He's coming. We are the bride. What have we made ready? When He comes, will we be proud when He comes and we say, please come into my home. Please come into my heart. Let me show you what is here. He is coming. We are to make ourselves ready. What we see here in verse 7, the text promises a restored intimacy with God as His purpose develops within His people. A promise that you see reiterated within Scripture with the, with the uh, children of Israel that break the covenant, break the intimacy, but yet He promises renewal through each covenant that I want this renewed intimacy. And then the buck stopped with Jesus. Enough covenants, we've got Jesus now. Okay, enough of these, we've got Jesus. This is how it's done. We find Jesus, He sets the mold, we follow the mold. Jesus is the way to intimacy. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 54, Hosea 2, Hosea 11, we see Israel is called God's wife. But in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, the metaphor is then transferred to the church. It was once Israel. It's God's chosen people. But we see in Ephesians that the metaphor is now changed to the church. In the Old Testament, God is intimate. Everybody flip to Psalm 139 for me. Psalm 139. This is going to be the passage of passages for you today. Psalm 139. We've got uh, 24 verses here. I'm not going to read the verse itself. I'm going to read what it's stating as I go through an outline. I want you to be reading this verse as I state the thought. Verse 1, what you see there, he searches and knows us. Come on and read that. Verses 2 and 3, his eye is always on us. Verse 4, he hears all that we say. Verse 5, and his hand is upon us. Verse 6, all of this staggers the psalmist. Verse 7 through 12, God's presence is always there in heaven or hell, in darkness or in the light. Presence is always there, 7 to 12. Verses 13 through 16. But why is it that God knows us so intimately? The answer is that He has created us. Verses 13 through 16.
Verses 22, I mean 23 through 24. He concludes with an invitation for God to search him, try him, know him, and lead him in every way everlasting. While you've got your phone now, the Facebook post for today is verse 14. Psalm 139, verse 14. And when you post this verse, post, you know, 50baptist.com, post people that are in this room, post where you're at when you post it. Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Kind of a thesis, a key verse of this entire chapter. 50baptist.com, Psalm 139, 14. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. We see that in the Old Testament. Jesus in the New Testament wants a relationship. We see in Luke 14, 26, he says that if anyone comes to me, anyone comes to me with a relationship. In John chapter 10, we see that he is contrasted as the good shepherd. We see this in verses 3 and 27. He even says in this chapter, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. They know my voice. I've got two chocolate labs at the house. They know our vehicle sound. They just don't even know my voice. But we can see them on the corner of the property where, where their collar lets them go. When we come around the corner, they've already heard our car enter into the neighborhood. It's the weirdest thing, but they expect us. Their tails are already wagging. They know we're coming. They don't do that with every car. They memorize how our car sounds. We just got a cat yesterday. Cat doesn't know anything. Doesn't know the sound, doesn't know no, doesn't know yes, knows kitty litter. That's the only promise for his life. We found a little kitty just this past week that had a broke leg. So we took him in, and little Emma named him, well, we're going to try to name him Figaro, but she said, I like Figaro, but I want to call him Toots. <laughs> Sounds so creepy again. I don't know, man. It just is. Yeah, she calls him to it, so all right. He's like an old man or something. So we see that we were built for intimacy, and we see that God desires enemy with it, intimacy with us, but our part in intimacy is this. Romans 8, verses 14 and 17 tell us that in Christ with the Holy Spirit, we can enjoy the privileges that Jesus is a sonship, being rich. And loving and intimacy. We can enjoy those things with Jesus. So how would I have this spiritual intimacy? There are definitions of what spiritual intimacy is. Or how you can have it, faults of it, that you find it through nurturing a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You nurture it. You work with it. How are you to have an intimate relationship with a human being? Well, first, you've got to have it with God because you know you cannot know intimacy or love unless you know it from God first. And then when you know it from God, then you can give it to someone else through you. But it doesn't just happen like this. Too many times do we think we can just do this and you know that I love you. This and you know that I'm intimate. We live in a world where premarital sex is going out the roof. Why? Because people don't know what intimacy and love is and they think I can give this one act and all of a sudden you know that I'm intimate or in love with you. But all that does is cause more problems. It causes more issue. Nurturing a personal relationship with God through Christ. John 15, 14 says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. What I command you. Some of you, that might sound like a dictator. But you know Jesus Christ is not a dictator. He has told us what is true, what is loving, what is kind, what is gentle. He's told us these things. So if we do those things, we know Him and we are His friends. Intimacy with Him is the motive for loving as He loves. We are called, while nurturing this relationship, to call our God Father. The word Abba Father is found in Mark 14, 36. And we see it's a model of intimacy there in Romans 8, 15 as well. See, Jesus talking about it as he's pleading with, with God, if this cup can be removed from me, Father. You think that Jesus in this place of torment was probably in the most intimate place with God. 
He was prepared to be our sacrifice. And doesn't that always kind of work out that way? Jesus spent 40 days fasting, and then the devil hits him. He says, man, you want some power? Do this. You want some food? Do this. You want some fame? Do this. It's right when you're right prepared. When, when you work so hard to be so intimate, that's when the devil really wants to hit because you're on your way. You're on your way, son. You're on your way to be intimate. You're on your way to have that religion. You're on your way. And the devil knows it. And if he can be around you, he's going to do all that he can. He tried it with Jesus. If he's going to try it with Jesus, he knew who Jesus was. He was up there in heaven with him. He knew who Jesus was. And if he tried it with Jesus, and he's that stupid, you know he's going to try it with you. You know he's going to try it with me. There's not a Christian on the face of this world that is off limits to Satan. He's going to go after all of us. There's not a pastor. There's not an elder. There's not a deacon. There's not a teacher. There's not a Christian, a Christ follower. There's not a Pentecostal, a Baptist, a Catholic. There's nobody that's immune. It's right when you start getting into that, into that mode of intimacy, when you start really getting into it, that he's going to attack, that he's going to come. And that's why I believe most of us today, that's why we struggle with intimacy because we still lose. We keep losing every time we get hit. He attacks and he attacks and he attacks. He doesn't want us to have an intimate relationship because when we do, and I'm not talking about salvation for us, okay? I'm not talking about salvation. A lot of us in this room, if not all of us, are heading to heaven. All right, woo, yeah, that's awesome. We're going to enjoy that time. It's going to be great. What I'm talking about is right now, right here, this place at this time, and the effectiveness and the wardrobe that we're going to be allowed to wear when we meet our Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to have it. He knows just as soon as you become intimate, all of a sudden the fruits just start exploding. You don't just make fruit. Your fruit just explodes on people. Your Christian life is like some little freaking Gallagher concert or something. You start making so many fruit, it's just going to get all over everybody. And you're like, oh my goodness, I am contagious as a Christian. Amen. Because you're intimate. Because you're intimate with God, the living God. Think about the other things you've been intimate with. Think about just sin. Don't think about people. Think about sin. You have the power of whatever it is that you're intimate with. <coughs> when, you're, when you're intimate with things that are, that are sinful and nasty, you become enraged and empowered by anger and things that are nasty and evil. But when you're intimate with the good God loving, when, when the when good that is God that is all powerful and all holy, all of a sudden you're empowered by something totally different. The devil doesn't want it. We as believers are going to be onslaughted. Onslaughted. Every day that we try. Some of you guys tried fasting this week. Good. Any of you attacked this week? Now, every one of you guys that talked about fasting talked about the struggle. Not talking about not being able to fast, but talking about the struggle that came with it. Why? Because the devil hates you and knows what he wants out of your life. And we can, we can just roll over and let him do it. And say, oh, it's too much for me. But we can strengthen our intimate relationship with God. Continuing the prayer, continuing the fasting, continuing talking with him, being transparent with him, fellowshipping with him, talking about him, knowing about him, reading about him, and doing all the things we can to nurture this relationship. <coughs> Call him Father. Theologically, when we call him Father, it sets us apart from other religions. Because when I pray to an all creating God, and I say to him, you are my Father. You're not just some God. You're not just some crony. You're not just some alien that's up there that's done something looking down on us. You're my Father because you are intimate. You are personal. You transcend time, but yet you are imminent. You are here in my life. You want to be in my life. So whenever I pray to Father, it freaks other religions out because they don't have it. They want it badly, and they don't have it. There's not another Jesus in another religion, if you didn't know. We've got the Jesus, and they really want the Jesus. When we say Father, it says something about our theology. It also says something about our enemies. It's true you don't call him Father until you really really tore up and sold up about them. Now you can, oh, Father, whatever, God, heaven. We can rattle off the name, but it's different when you got it. You got it here. It's different when it's in a, in a world 
that is fatherless, he desires to be our father. In a world of perverse intimacy, he desires to give us a holy love. And in a world of brokenness, he desires to have a relationship with you and I that will make us whole again. That's what he desires. Are you a fan? A fan just talks about it. Or are you a father? One that runs after.